Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we thought for people who were approaching midlife and beyond and sitting around perhaps in retirement trying to figure out what they would like to do with their lives, perhaps it might be a change of venue to think about something new that you maybe have never experienced before. Today we're going to learn about what it's like to go to a coding boot camp. That's right, coding software that is. That is a self-paced program that you can learn at your own speed. After all, we're moving from the digital age to the robotic age. Many of the future jobs will require coding skills, anywhere ranging from 3D printing to building driverless cars. And believe it or not, for those of you out there that think this may take a lot of science and math, no coding experience is necessary. On the program today, we're going to be joined by a president and founder of what is known as the Tech Academy, and he's going to be talking about the wonderment that you can discover that offers real-world, hands-on software development training for those of you who want to perhaps change careers or find something you want to do at home and earn some extra money. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 Radio program today our guest and CEO of the Tech Academy, Eric Gross. Eric, thank you for being on the program today. Absolutely, Daniel. Thank you for having me. You bet. Now let's talk about how this all started. I always find the story unique when somebody finds a what I would call a very unique need out there that offers opportunity for a lot of people in ways that they wouldn't have thought of before. Absolutely. Yeah, telling the origin story is, is, is always quite gratifying because it, it revolves so strongly around the idea of helping people, which is quite honestly what, what gets me jazzed. But Honestly, the way it started, though, was that I needed some help. I, I've been a working software developer for a long time, and it, it's pretty common as a developer to pull in side work. You know, you alluded to the idea of, you know, you know maybe earn some income money on the side, right? Well, I always had been pulling in things like that, and I had a, a number of, like, side gigs where I, I found that I really needed, like, entry-level developers to handle some of the more rudimentary aspects of, of what I was doing, and I couldn't find any entry-level developers. It was so hard to find talent. And I've been aware of that problem for a little while. And then one day my, my teenage son comes home from high school. He'd been doing a coding class, actually, which made me really happy as a developer. And he said, Dad, I want to do a, a, a developer boot camp. This is in like 2013. Like, what is a developer boot camp? So I did the research and I found out that in the summer of 2012, a group of developers down in the San Francisco Bay Area had a really bright idea. There were three of them. They didn't have work for the summer. They were contract workers. And they all got together and said, hey, why don't we try to take a, you know, a few of our friends, if they're willing to give us the summer, see if we can make developers out of them. So they told their, you know, their friends, about a dozen people, you we're going to ask you to take the entire summer off. You can't work. You have to tell your significant other that you're not going to see them for about three months. But if you'll do that, we'll see if we can, can make you into developers. And they did it, and it worked. Like 11 of those 12 people made it through this really intense summer and got jobs as developers at the end of it. So these three guys went, wow, we have a business. And they called it Dev Boot Camp. So by the time I come around about nine months later in the spring of 2013, this is a going thing, and it's a new trend in the development world, and I went, oh, my God, I can do this. So that was the origin of the idea. To flash forward, obviously, a lot of water under the bridge, but at this point, the Tech Academy has six campuses nationwide. We're acknowledged as the best boot camp in the country by a lot of the major industry um, you know, monitoring groups. Well, we're being featured on you know, a cable show called World's Greatest as the best boot camp you know, in, in, in the country. And we've helped you know, thousands of people get jobs in technology. So that's a bit of how this started and a real brief description of where we're at right now. Now, I know a lot of people thinking, well, you know, software coding, uh, how do I measure up? I mean, what does it really take to get started, in, and is it something I can become interested in? I know uh, that could be some of the you know, questions maybe some of our listeners are thinking about. And, and it, it is a good question. Um, in fact, for someone who's not familiar with the industry, one of the more logical assumptions is, uh, well, a couple of them, one, 
that is just a really math intensive, nerdy, geeky sort of activity. And two, that it's not a very social activity, that you're like buried in a cubicle somewhere just banging away at a keyboard. The fact of the matter is that creating technical tools for people, creating software is a very social activity. It's a very people oriented activity, which is a surprise to people sometimes when they find out about the program. But the fact is that no one person is going to come up with the idea for the software and produce the whole thing themselves all by themselves. It's just not feasible. What happens more often is there's a collaboration between the end user of the software and the business that administers it and the people actually creating the computer programs and the project managers who run the overall thing and several other types of roles. The collaboration between all of them in order to successfully pull off a software project. And for that, you need people that love people, people that are willing to communicate and achieve collaboration and, 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 and work together. And that's the world of technology nowadays. So the, the fact is if you're a social person who likes other people and working together, and you can do basic math, and then you can learn the code, and you can enjoy the work. Now let's talk about the preparations or, you know, I, I, you, when you think of coding, you think of, you know, complex math and symbols, things like that, because of what they show you, for instance, on uh, movies, you know, something like hackers, <laughs> for instance, you know, yes. which, is, which is a good idea. You see all these things and you think, okay, well, how can I do something like this? But I remember, for instance, uh, and this will probably be a nice bridge, too, to get people a good understanding I know that a lot of, if not all, public libraries uh, that I know of online offer basic coding tutorials and classes that you can take for free. I mean, there's a lot of that out there. And I remember uh, at a particular library that I was at, uh, I, I discovered this. So I went home and went online, and sure enough, I went and they said, you can learn you know, basic coding. And, and I started mm -hmm. to do it, and I realized, you know, wait a minute. <clears throat> and I, I didn't spend a whole lot of time with it, but it was real simple stuff just to get a feel for what it is. I mean, it really was taking you, you know, baby steps, A, B, C. So yeah. it wasn't a lot of long, complicated, crazy stuff like, again, you would see in a movie like Hackers, for instance. But, mm -hmm. you know, on the other hand, I realized, well, this was a lot simpler at least than I thought it was from the perspective of thinking there was a lot of science and math, for instance. Yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. What, what actually occurs is this, is the core activity of creating these computer programs, you know, coding is what they call it, the core activity in and of itself doesn't necessarily involve a bunch of higher math and complex science and that sort of thing. Because it, it's actually a relatively simple thing. Computers are simple. They can only do one thing at a time. The number of things they can do is only, you know, a couple of dozen things that's built into a computer they can do. They seem super fancy because they can do billions of these things a second. But at the end of the day, there's only a few things they can do. And once you understand what those core things are, you're just building instruction sets from what that machine can do. It's not actually super complex at its core. Now, that said, one, you're right. Like the presentation in the media, and I understand why, Movies and TV shows have a job to do, right? But the presentation in the media would imply that it's super deep, heavy science nerds better wear a white coat and a pocket protector, you know? But that, that isn't true. Now, I will say that the business domain that you're working in, the you know, area of the economy or you know, activity that the software is being used in might itself be very heavy on you know, science. If you're doing medical research, for example, or advanced financial modeling for some big giant insurance company, yeah, there's going to be heavy math skills involved, but that actually isn't because of computer programming. It's because of the area that programming is used in. And those are very specialized jobs, and frankly, most of the heavy lifting in terms of scientific ability is done by other people besides the programmers, besides the coders. So you're right about the perception, Daniel. The reality is that nearly every coding job, all you actually need, like I said, is just you know ability to read and write and do basic math, and you're going to be fine. 
Now, here's a big thing. Uh, this might even tease some of the uh, listeners out there because you hear so much about people developing apps. And in some mm-hmm. cases, they do pretty well when they strike gold, although I'm sure that's probably about as far and few between as a lightning strike. But <laughs> yes. it, it does happen. But let's talk about that because there are new apps being developed every day. How does something like what your school teaches, and I know this is probably scratching the surface of what people actually learn, which we'll get into in a, in a bit, but let's talk about that a little bit. That's a really neat thing to ask about because, yeah, it is something that you hear about a lot. You hear about these, like, you know, unbelievable success stories on people to create the next killer app. Now, first of all, you're right. You know, getting a massive success on something like that is like, you know, like a lightning strike. But... There is plenty to be work to be had in that area. The second thing I want to say is at the end of the day, you know, those apps, you know, that you hear about, there's an app for that. They're just computer programs. At the core of how they're built, they're no different than the calculator program that you have on your computer. And once you've gone through any decent boot camp, and ours is a very decent coding boot camp, once you've learned the fundamentals of creating computer programs, it doesn't matter whether you're making one that's an app to go on your mobile phone, or whether it's a desktop application to be used on you know, a laptop or a desktop computer, or you know, a specialized computer program to be used on some you know, kiosk at a mall somewhere. It's still just a computer program. And so the skills that you learn are very transferable because the core activity underneath the hood is all the same. So I'm glad you brought that up. Apps have a very you know, a cool, sexy you know, wow factor. You know. But they're still just computer programs. And when you learn to create a computer program, you can create it for a lot of different uses or physical platforms. Yeah, I thought I'd bring that up because I remember I was even watching a quick episode of Shark Tank. And Mark Mm -hmm. Cuban, of course, is one of the people on the panel that decides whether or not they're going to invest in an idea. And it came to me this morning, and I brought that up because there was a young man that came on there with an app and he was describing what it does, but Mark Cuban thought, well, I could see why you're doing this, but I'm kind of interested in that for something much different. You know, here's this billionaire, you know, tech guy, and boom, something mm-hmm. like that. But it's kind of one of those things as we're talking about. Yeah, like you said, it's real basic what an app does. I agree with that. But, you know, the idea of the, you know, you're going to, you know, hit it big. But what we're talking about here isn't just developing apps. To me, I would guess what your boot camp teaches that almost becomes almost like child's play. Would that be kind of stretching it or pretty accurate? It, it, it isn't actually stretching it from one point of view. You've got, you've got a, a pretty valid point of view because, again, like, like I've, I've said, if you, can, can create a, if you can create a computer program, you can create a computer program. An app is just another computer program. Now, that said, I don't want to make it seem like you know, it's a walk in the park to learn how to code. There's a great deal of knowledge that you need just to be able to operate in the ecosystem of technology. It's our job as educators to give you that knowledge, but there is a fair bit to learn. And the reason I bring that up is because when, when you're done with a software developer boot camp, whether it's ours or, or, or another, you're prepared to be a, you know, an, a well-rounded entry-level developer. The best place for you at that point is part of, as part of an existing team of developers where you can really you know, have some time to cultivate your trade and add to your knowledge and get experience under your belt, it's only going to be a little while till you're you know, the hotshot who can lead a project from initial you know, ideation all the way through the planning stages, through the actual development, through the testing, and then through final deployment and use by the intended end user. It will be a little while till you're up to that. Of course, you're going to get there if you keep working. But at the beginning, you're going to be a really, really effective member of an existing development team. So I bring that up to set the right expectations because it's a very feasible career shift for people. There are people every day who transition from their existing careers into technology, but you do want to have the right expectations. You know, there's a fair bit to learn. You can get through it. And when you're done, your, your best places as part of a team to really be part of a working installation. And then eventually, you'll move out on your own and be the leader and be the you know, lead developer, that sort of thing. Now, let's talk about, uh, first of all, the boot camp itself. Is it something you have to go in and attend class in a particular place? Is it something that can be learned from home? 
Let's talk about what it's involved, because I know that you actually have grown into quite a few campuses, from my understanding. Yeah, we, we, we have. And we're, pre we're pretty proud of that. We, we have a really great team that works really hard. But to, to directly answer your question, the way our particular software developer boot camps work is they can be done three different ways. They can be done fully online, they can be done completely on campus, or they can be done as a hybrid where you do some portion of it you know, from the community to your home or whatever, and then other parts of it from the actual campuses. So we've got you know, our flagship campus here in Portland, Oregon where we started, and we have um, you know, campuses in Seattle and Denver, and um, we're opening Salt Lake and Phoenix and, um, and uh, Austin within the next couple of months. And so there's a lot of versatility there for people in terms of you know, what they need and want and the flexibility of schedule. But to just answer the question about the core boot camp experience itself, we do things a little bit differently. Our programs are self-paced, which means you, know, you can sign up and start any time. And as you're going through the program, if there's parts of it that you're just doing really well on, you just keep rolling and everything is fine. But if you hit something that just maybe takes you a little bit longer to get through, maybe takes a little more mental work or you need a bit more help, that's actually fine. That's built into the program. That part just takes you a little bit longer, and then other parts take you less, and you go through. But the important point is you don't get left behind. You don't get outpaced because the, the class has to move on past you because, sorry, everybody's moving at the same speed, and we're done with that, so you'll have to figure it out on your own. We don't have that philosophy. Our point of view is if you qualify to get into school, and you're a bright person, and you're working hard, yeah, nobody learns at the same pace. So we accommodate that for you in terms of how we structure the program. Now, how can someone find out and get started with all this? And, and how long is it, that sort of a thing? Well, the best place to go for data about the programs is learncodinganywhere.com. Pretty simple, straightforward, Learn Coding Anywhere, because we do have students all over the world. We thought that was a pretty appropriate you know, name for our website. So if you go to LearnCodingAnywhere.com, you'll see all the information about the various boot camps we have. We've got four different offerings and types of boot camps and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's a, a place to look. But in terms of you know, how long it takes, that's the, the interesting thing about a self-paced program is we've got some, at this point, because we've got, you know, we've signed up you know, well over 1,000 people, but we know roughly what it takes to get through each of these boot camps. Right? And there's either full-time options or part-time because we want to accommodate people that you know, aren't able to just quit their jobs or whatever and, and do this all the time. So the boot camps range anywhere from like you know, eight or nine weeks up to you know, 26 weeks, a full half a year. It just depends on which of the boot camps you want to do, what you're looking to get out of it, and frankly, how much you can put into it in terms of inten intensive study. So short answer, between 8 and 26 weeks, depending upon the boot camp you do. Now, it's really fascinating. Now, let's talk about some of the uh, things that people who have graduated went on to go do what they got involved with. Yeah, that's a, a lot of fun. I, I mean, and the, the stories are legion. Like, we, we, we try to keep pretty good tabs on, on our graduates. We're proud of them. We take a great deal of joy in their successes. But, but we've had people, you know, in terms of local employers, anybody who knows you know, the, 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 the Portland market at least, and I, the public recognizing we've had people you know, get jobs at Intel and Urban Airship and um, you know, Puppet Labs and you know, the local Amazon office and Google and all that kind of thing. So you know, the, the, the heavy hitters that everybody recognizes are there. We've had people get jobs at Disney, and those things are great. But the fact of the matter is that almost every industry needs technology. So we've had graduates you know, go out and get a job actually, and they end up in project management. They're the ones that achieve collaboration between different elements of the different teams inside a company. We had, you know, one of our, our earlier um, uh, graduates from back in like 2014 who um, now works for Intel as a project manager, and she's just, she's a sweetheart. She absolutely loves what she's doing because she gets a combination of the technical deep dive of being a skilled developer, which she is, an actual software developer, with the joy of working with teams and collaboration and, and coordinating everybody's efforts to arrive at a final done product. So those are some of the things that people do. And in fact, this just brings up another point I'd like to make, which is that you know, there's this image of 
software developers and coders that the media puts out there, or you might talk to your friends and get the idea, that it's just one job. It's sitting down and writing these computer programs. But that isn't the truth. Like I said earlier, it's a, a very collaborative activity. So if you're trained in the technology world, like you would get as a product of our boot camps, there's so many different roles for you. There's so many different places that you can sort of settle into and really enjoy what you do, and they're not all just sitting down and hardcore coding. So our graduates have gotten jobs in, in healthcare and manufacturing and you know, in you know, publishing and all the different you know, business areas you'd expect that go on in life, and it's all different types of roles from being an actual software developer to being a project manager to being you know, what's called change management and coordinating broad change across the you know, the, the large software applications, um, being technical writers. You know, there's, there's so many different things you can do to take advantage of your interests, the prior skills that you already built up and are bringing to the table, but now you can be so much more valuable because you can code. You know how the computer works. You know how these machines operate. And let's be frank, technology workers get paid a lot of money. So there's a lot of roles that you can end up in. Now let's talk about you know you're expanding uh, this. It sounds like there's a lot of demand out there, and a lot of people are very happy. I understand you've had hundreds of students that went on to uh, start building great careers and all this. In fact, one of the things I wanted to address I thought was really unique is recently I've been hearing commercials about Google recruiting people with no experience, and they put them through what seems to be a, a let's just call it, I guess, their own boot camp. But if they want to switch, and then once they do that, then they decide whether or not you're going to be able to move on and work with Google. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, Daniel, I just want to acknowledge you um, for being aware and, and, and paying attention. I really appreciate your research. Um, this, is, this is a really interesting area for me as an educator and as a business owner in this, in this space. Um, I'm seeing the same thing, I, and, and, and honestly, I think it's really wonderful. So, the, look, there's the pragmatic. You know, and, and, I, and I want to bring that up, Eric. Sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's no, unique fine. that you see these tech companies going. You know, what do you say we shake things up and go after people who, you know, didn't you know start playing around with this stuff at birth, but people who yes. come from different backgrounds because we want fresh perspectives. I'll give you an idea. Like I remember mm -hmm. years ago. As I was beginning in radio, people go, you seem to have a pretty unique perspective when you're on the, on, on the air. And I said, well, one of the things I enjoy doing is I love serving and bartending. So yeah. I felt that I was bringing a real-world perspective into the radio station. And when I started realizing what I was doing, you know, and then I would tell people, I do radio, and for some reason people think when you're in entertainment you're making all this money, you know, for one thing. <laughs> you do pretty well, but, you know, you're not, you know, like a lot of these people that have sold out and they're working for these big mega media corporations. I said, I wanted right. to be more down to earth, so when people hear me on the air, it sounds like they're talking to me in person. And, again, getting real-world experience. So when I would get the question asked, when I would say, I do radio, what are you doing this for? Well, do you realize how much I get to continually hone my communication skill in an environment like this yeah. and bounce ideas off people? What do you think about this or that? You know, I'm, and I'll take that into studio with a guest about a particular subject, and then pretty mm -hmm. soon I'm solving problems. Like somebody will come in to, would come into the restaurant, and their, and their child may have, let's say, ADD, and I just got done dealing with an expert on that. And I get to right. say, did you think about this, this, and this? So now I'm really bridging the gap and going, A, I love doing that kind of work, and B, it made sense because I love doing radio. It's all the same thing. It's communication. So that's why I brought that up, you know, uh, the but, idea of Google, and they're, they're reaching out to, like, the common person through a radio ad. So anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. And um, by the way, I've, I've known that about you for a while, and I, and I admire it. Right? And, and so... I do genuinely think you provide a really, really good service. Well, you, thank you. Which is why I really have enjoyed the involvement. Now, and I want to I want to bring up one aspect of that that is connected to what you have observed about you know some of these technology companies getting a little more like creative in in their efforts to handle you know, technical talent. Let, let, let's be honest. Part of it is pragmatic. There is a great talent shortage in technology. 
That's not just the owner of a boot camp talking. The Bureau of Labor and Statistics for the United States is very clear about that. They did a study in 2012, and they you know, revamped that study again about a year ago. And we're, like over the next five years, about 800,000 jobs short. In other words, the available production of technical workers from universities, colleges, and even boot camps now, which are a really strong contributor, we can't match the demand. We're upside down by hundreds of thousands of jobs. So it is pragmatic to a certain extent, Daniel, that these technology companies are like, we better figure out how to create the talent because we need it. But the other part of it is everything you said, and this speaks directly to the type of audience that, that you have for this program. It's so true that an experienced worker who's been out in the marketplace for you know, a couple of decades and has you know, a deep wealth of experience in one business domain, those skills transfer so well to technology. They transfer so well. If you've been able to operate and maintain a job for 20 years in one industry, well then what do you bring to the table in terms of achieving consensus, collaboration, dealing with difficult people, dealing with real world problems that businesses face all the time, and then you're you know, trained as a technology worker? Your entire job as a technology worker is to create technical tools that solve real world problems and help people do their jobs better. And as an, you know, a person who's been in the marketplace 10, 20, 30 years, you've got so much to bring to the table. It's something that we stress really strongly when we have people who are in their 40s, 50s, or 60s looking at doing you know, our boot camps. They, they worry, like, am I too old? No. In fact, you've got a distinct advantage over the young punk who is just a barista and is 22 years old. <laughs> yeah, they may have that young enthusiasm and they grew up right. using technology and they speak iPad or whatever. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You've got something that they literally can't get. You've uh -huh. got years of experience and it really matters to this industry. So uh -huh. I would highly encourage people considering the career transition don't, you know, to look at it and don't think that the age is actually against you. It's actually for you mm -hmm. in the right circumstances. Now, here's something, too, you might even throw a shout-out to uh, our listeners out there. When it comes to technology in the next 10 to 20 years, and I know uh, my wife loves talking about this as we have uh, people that like to uh, that we tap into, uh, like the Da Vinci Institute, for instance, which is about you know cutting edge trends and the futurists and things like mm -hmm. that. So, give our listeners an idea about technology and jobs, the expectation of what's going to be needed, even in the next five to fifteen years. I mean, we're talking this is short term goal stuff. Yeah. Okay, so five, I can give you the real short term five years. The, the statistic I mentioned previously is well worth looking at. Um, we are about seven to 800,000 jobs short projected over the next four to five years. In technology, you know, the, the kind of technology jobs that we train people for at our boot camps. So that's the short term, right? Um, now, I want to stress something. It's no guarantee, there's no guarantee that you're going to get through this boot camp and you're automatically going to get a job. That's not true for any training you'll do anywhere. You really do still need to work your butt off to get a job when, you, when you're done. We help with that. We're very good at getting people jobs. I just want to stress that point because there's no guarantee on it. But you are, on the flip side, going into a market that has like a 1% unemployment rate, I think, for technology workers. It's insane. So the short-term prospects in three, five, six years, extremely good. Now, for the longer term projects, extend to five to 15 years, there's a couple different schools of thought you see, and you probably look at this yourself, Daniel, if you're paying attention. You see these talks about automation, replacing jobs, and all that kind of stuff. My opinion, having worked in this industry for about 32, 33 years, you'll never be without a job if you're a trained technology worker. Because there are a couple things you bring to the table that will never be able to be replaced by a machine. And one of them is, how to think like a software developer, how to think like an engineer. There's so much to that skill. It's a soft skill. It's not something you can just write down on a piece of paper. But the approach to problem solving that any skilled software developer or technology worker has is their most valuable asset. It's not the specific computer languages they know, the specific hardware they know. It's do they know how to 
think like a software developer. And that is a problem solver. It's an, ana an, an ana analyzer of systems. It is an understander of root causes. And when you've got that skill, it doesn't matter what the technology landscape looks like because it does constantly shift. What you bring to the table is an ability to think, to analyze the situation, to figure out why it's not meeting its objectives, and to find and fix the root cause. And that will never go out of style. It will never not be valuable, which means that the long-term prospects, the five to 15 years down the line, they are extremely good for technology workers. That's my opinion as a technology worker. Well, and not only that, but here, let's go ahead and enlighten your opinion to a better level because you alluded earlier about you know, going into these schools and a lot of times you see a dangling promise of a job and generally it's people sitting at home either looking for work or not really trying. But, you know, mm -hmm. there's the carrot thrown out in front of you, so you spend a good few thousand dollars to, to, to shift gears and then you realize, well, I haven't been in school for a while oh, my goodness, and pretty soon you're in the same habits of, you know, pay, paying and watching TV and just where you were when you see me at in the first place. Mm -hmm. but to add some clarity to that, what is your chance of getting work would be this, okay? You would go to a boot camp, like Tech Academy boot camp. You're moving mm -hmm. into a technology environment that is bursting, and as you said, it's got a 1% employment rate right now. I mean, that's a huge opening for opportunity. That's the first part of it. So you get a set of tools. The tools mm -hmm. you have that everybody should have, especially whether it's a desire for change or whether it's a desire to improve themselves, is do you have initiative and enthusiasm? All you provide is the tools, the opportunity. If your initiative is right there and your enthusiasm is there, I don't see how opportunity could avoid you. You know, it just doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. And this, I know those are two key point. things as a, as a you know as a leader or a manager that I've been over the years that I look for in a person. Whether you have the skill or not, if you've got those two things, you're going to win every single time because somebody will be willing to teach you something. And that yes. being said, you're teaching something that you get to jump into the deep end of the pool. <laughs> and there's a lot mm -hmm. of it to swim in. It sounds like. Yeah, there, there is. I love that point, Daniel. You're so spot on that you know your attitude, your your internal like motivation, desire really does matter. And I want to like refine that a little bit for the technology world. Yeah, look, it's a big ask for a technology manager to take a boot camp graduate who doesn't have you know any you know real world experience and bring them onto their team. It's a big ask, and yet it happens every day. I think we have a 78% hiring rate right now as we speak you know, in uh, you know, 2019. Um, and it, it, it's quite good. And I'll tell you what makes the difference for people to get hired when they get done with a, a decent boot camp like ours. There's a couple things. One is we actually have a course on how to get hired. You don't just learn the technology here. You learn the actual skills necessary to get a job in technology because they aren't native to the person. There's a specific way to go about it here, right? But secondly, it's your tenacity. It's that unwavering, I will not stop until I get hired. That's the chief motivation, like overriding thing that matters. You, you need to be driven, right? Now that said, the, the thing that the hiring manager is typically looking for when they're hiring someone new to the technology field is not, like I said earlier, what exact skills do you have and what languages do you do and all that sort of thing. They're actually looking for someone who they would like to work with. Do they like your personality? And more precisely, are you teachable? Are you willing to actually acknowledge when there's things that you don't know? And are you eager to remedy that situation and know things? So I'll be very blunt. If you're the kind of person that almost automatically gainsays or counters what people tell you, and you feel a need to like prejudge things, technology is not for you at all, really. But if, on the other hand, you relish the idea of finding out that you don't know something, my God, you'll love this industry. It's fantastic. Every single, and, and I'm an experienced developer, but every single time I found something where I'm like, wow, I just found a hole in my knowledge. I get excited. I get excited about like my God, I get to fix that, and the next time I bump into the, the use case for that, mm. I've got that under my belt. If you've got that kind of an attitude, 
any hiring manager worth his or her salt is going to love you. Mm -hmm. And again, that's the value of coming into this as an experienced worker in the 50s or 60s. You know what it's like to have your industry shift and change underneath you and have to pivot. And if you can tell a story to a hiring manager about how you managed to navigate that and come out on top, they will love that. They will want to hire you because of that, not because you know the exact right computer programming knowledge or Skill or language, or you know, and I know too, Eric, that you as a business owner, and I certainly uh, feel the same way as well. Is this is that people that own companies don't want to hire people who come in and do the job and get paid for that. They really want to hire people that are going to come in and solve problems and help that company grow. And here's the beauty of it: when you do that for a company, you grow in skill level too to become to a point that you're either a going to be an irreplaceable or you're going to go off and start your own company. And I think yep. it's so funny that we have in America this entitlement attitude, I've shown up, you need to pay me, and I'm not going to do any more than that. You know? And the fact is, <laughs> that person, that kind of thinking, that person is going to be the one in midlife and beyond that's going to sit there bitter wondering why nobody's opened the doors for them and why yep. they're not any better along than they were when they were in their 20s. And I remember yep. that was actually a valuable piece of advice. An old machinist at a company that my dad had actually owned, he says, <clears throat> when you can train somebody to do your job better than you do it, you have just became invaluable. And he says, you should always be trying to add more to your skill set in any job. You know, People look at it, well, why should I do more and be paid the same? And I said, because mm -hmm. you take that skill with you, stupid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the pay will stay the same, but you don't. And that's what matters. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what we're talking about here. It, mm -hmm. it is. It totally is. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and there's a point I want to make but, um, on, on that directly. But the other thing that I've learned, and it sounds like you have as well, is at the end of the day, your certainty and confidence in yourself is your most valuable asset. And it even becomes a slight arrogance, which you have to train yourself to kind of avoid because you know you're valuable. You know, yeah, you may not love it. Donald Trump, but he knows what he's worth. <laughs> yeah, he has no, no doubts about it. Now, there's actually a point to be made here, I think, that directly relates to the idea of someone trying to transition into this industry at you know, a more advanced age. Right? And, and here's the point I want to make is that Let's say you're in your you know, 40s or 50s and you're contemplating a career transition like this. Right? So you're going to go to someone and try to convince them to hire you. The, the fact is that what you bring to the table in terms of your personal confidence and certainty is the most overriding thing. And it's the thing that's going to help you get the job. Now, you talked earlier about like, you know, why should I you know, ex you know, do more and get paid the same. Here's the thing. There's a double-edged sword here. In this industry, they don't care much about what certifications you have or where you got your degree or even if you have a degree or, or, or. What they care about is, one, can you code? Can you actually get the job done and make something that works? And two, are you a nice person that people want to work with? That is, and I'm telling you, after decades of experience in this industry, that's almost a uniform truth. They don't care about your bona fides and your certifications. Those things are kind of nice. Can you get the job done? And are you decent and fun to work with? And if you are, great. You've got job security for the rest of your life. But if those things aren't true, if you're obnoxious and hard to work with and you think you're right all the time and you don't want to learn, then you're toast. It doesn't matter if you have the right certification or you went to the right college or whatever. No development shop worth their salt is going to put up with you for very long. So, these just things to know, like self-exploration. If you know that you're kind of a person that you, know, you don't do well with constant change or you know, things you know, moving underneath you, technology is not for you because it changes very, very rapidly. But if on the other hand, you thrive in that and you constantly love the opportunity to constantly learn new things, then technology is fantastic. It rocks. Absolutely. And if nothing more, you can learn how to build your own website without having to leave it all to somebody else. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Eric, you know, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Again, we're talking with Eric Gross. He is the CEO and founder of the Tech Academy, which if you're interested in, and you should be anyway, 
uh, pursuing a career in coding, software development, things like that, as we've talked about. In the next 5 to 15 years, the demand is huge. The question is, are you the kind of person that's willing to adapt, learn, and grow and take a set of tools and go out there and just blaze a trail with your own destiny in mind? And that doesn't matter what age you are. And in fact, for those of you out there who are listening to the program, and we've got a few of you out there who are in retirement thinking, what do I want to do? Well, do you want to pump gas, or do you want to be the guy that develops a whole new pump and style that actually feeds the gas station that tells them just where their money is going, that sort of thing there? I mean, it's all up to you. Now, I know that listeners are going to go, well, you know, this all sounds pretty good, and we're not going to talk about the price or the cost. But more importantly, what I want to talk about when it comes to something like that is people, you've got to love these skeptics. And a lot Mm -hmm. of times, you know, they'll say, well, can I try something for free? Well, I've already addressed that at the beginning of the program. Go to the library. They've got coding classes you can take for free if you want to play around with it. But my attitude is this. When it comes to spending money to learn or buying something is you only get as much value out of what you spend your money on as you decide that value is worth, which means it's your Mm -hmm. own personal commitment. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. And by the way, um, I, I love the idea about going to, the, to, to libraries. You're an underutilized, re- underutilized resource. One of the things that you may not know about, uh, Daniel, because we've added this since you and I last talked, we actually deliver free coding classes at our flagship campus in Portland five days a week. And, and we do them for a very specific purpose. We want people to be able to just experience a little bit of coding to find out whether or not it's even for them. You know, you're right about the price, and you're right about the personal investment in your own learning. Those things are overriding concerns. But at the end of the day, if you have an opportunity to even find out whether or not the activity is something you either enjoy doing, man, take advantage of that. We have excellent free class instructors. We have them every single day. You can, go to, you, know, you can also find that on meetup.com. And come on down. Do a free class. Find out whether this is for you. But also do take to heart what Daniel said, that like, if you decide to jump in, jump in with everything you've got. You get out of this program and any decent education program what you put into it. And I think the last thing I'd like to leave the listeners with, because it sounds like we personally are certainly on the same page when it comes to enthusiasm, initiative, and desire is this, is that I remember a quote, and, and it was really unique, and it always sticks in the back of my mind, and it's real simple. It's this. If we were to had the ability or if we had decided to live to our fullest potential we would simply look back and be astounded with ourselves and it's amazing Mm -hmm. what you're willing and what you can do if you just make the decision to do it now this may be a way for some of you out there or this may not be a way but either way it's like in the uh, uh, the author Daniel Pink says he says pick up these kind of magazines and just kind of breeze through them and read every day. And he gave this nice variety of different magazines. And the whole reason is, he says, because it changes your language. And because of that, it changes your perspective on how you see the world. And if the Tech Academy could tweak you just a little bit, I mean, think about how awesome it would be if you could just build your own website, if you could just do that and you find yourself going, and then you're able to teach somebody else how to do that. That's exciting. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're growing, and that's what life is about. It's about learning and growing. So how yeah, can yeah. they find out more about the Tech Academy and, and, and things like that? Well, let me put it in one concise area, learncodinganywhere.com. Learncodinganywhere.com, okay. Yeah, right. That's a resource for everything involved in the core you know, offerings of the boot camps. And then if you go to meetup.com, Meet first of all, people aren't using – Meetup, M-E-E-T-U-P, Meetup. Okay, up. meet up. People aren't using Meetup, man. You want to. It's a wonderful resource for finding interesting things and groups and meetings in your city. I love Meetup.com. But if you go to Meetup.com and look up the Tech Academy, you're going to find everything we have there. We have all sorts of Meetups at our locations. We have our free coding classes. There's all sorts of ways to engage, and you'll find all that at Meetup.com. But for oh, the cool camp. Yeah, just go to learncodinginware.com and then check out Meetup. Check out Meetup just as a resource. I think you'll love it. Oh, I, I believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for being on the program. I always get excited and enthused whenever you're on, you know, sharing not only what it is you do, but the attitude that I know we both share about change and what it means to grow and to develop. And when you're doing that, you, we talk about aging and how do you age 
successfully and gracefully, and how do you live long? Well, it's just it's really that simple. You're learning and growing. You're contributing to the growth and learning of others, and you're always putting things ahead of you, you know, that you have to look forward to. And if you're doing that, yeah. goodness gracious, we don't know how long we could live, but it would almost yeah. seem like forever. <laughs> Yeah. Again, well, Eric, the, the, the act of you know the act of living, like making it actively living, is just a, a wonderful thing. And and I do want to acknowledge how much I appreciate what you do, well, like the message you put out of positively aging, positively moving into a, instead of it just happening to you and oh I happen to be getting older. Nah, mm, forget that. Absolutely. Take charge of your life. And I'm certain that you would have a quote that goes along something like this, is experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. <laughs> oh, ain't that the truth? You think building this business is going back to the way we planned? Think again. But yeah. we love where we are now. Exactly. Well, Eric, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daniel. You bet. I want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. Again, if you're out there and you're on your line on the computer, you can do a little bit of coding at beyond50radio.com and find out what we're up to. You can discover our newsletter, which is wonderful and a great read, and then that way you can find out what's going on in the world of Beyond 50 as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Beyond 50 radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>